Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about the fun exponential decay math of radioactivity. This is the um, HL kind of addition to our uh, rules for radioactivity, including half-lives and all that good stuff. So we're officially looking at the two equations related to all this in topic 12, uh, the last section before the options of your data booklet. Okay, so we're going to be looking at this um, as we... Uh, know from a little bit of study already, as you have a radioactive material, the total number of parent nuclei will decrease exponentially um, like so. So if we want to math them more than just like dividing by two every half-life um, and look at the spaces in between and do some other fun stuff, we will need some exponential decay equations. Well, uh, bam, 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 here they are. All right, these are the two equations in your data book with the ones in green. We can also look above. This is this here is not a data booklet equation, but hopefully looking at this and looking at this, you can see that this is the case. Um, real math nerds, you can look at this and look at this and maybe think about what kind of calculus is going on. Indeed, the activity is the rate of change of the parent nucleus, um, if that helps you see anything. But um, there's two equations. Both are exponential decay functions, e to the minus something something, with t as our uh, variable. So let's just break down um, what they are. It's all the same variables as before. So remember, A stands for activity, which which measures how quickly something is decaying. We measure it in becquerel, which is a count per second, um, is what a becquerel is. So if something is doing radioactive decay 500 times per second, that would have an activity of 500, 500 becquerel. Um, so A and N are both functions of time as we can see in the equations here. So they'll change over time. Both will decrease with that exponential decay curve. Um, lambda in this context, remember, represents the decay constant, which has some you know fun definition, like it's the probability per unit time that a single radioactive nucleus might decay in that time interval. Um, so we measure it in, a, it's really kind of percent per second or percent per year. Um, but, you know, the units work out to just seconds to the minus one or years to the minus one or any kind of time to the minus one. Um, if you want maybe a little better handle on it um, and you think a little mathematically, look at where the variable is. It's in the it's in the power on my E here for my exponential decay. Uh, it's basically your rate of decay. Um, yeah, if I change, if I have two samples that have different decay constants of different uh, radionuclides, then they'll decay at different rates, right? That's really what lambda affects here is the rate at which it will decay, which makes sense since this is related to um, how likely it is to decay. Um, capital N is the number, so it's just a counting number. There's no units, but it's the number of the parent nuclei. We're always looking at the parent here, and that's gonna be important because a lot of times we'll be looking at, they'll give us different information in the problem. Um, so just always think about that. This is the amount kind of remaining, you know, the total number of your original radioactive nuclei that are remaining. Um, and n sub zero is the starting number. So that's your initial number. That's the, um, you know, total number that are left. And t is the amount of time that has gone by since we decided that t equals zero. All right. Um, so just some exponential decay functions. Let's make sure we can use them. One thing you will need to use these equations for is you need to be able to calculate half-life given the decay constant and vice versa. So we need to use these equations to do that. Um, so think about the definition of half-life and how we might do that. Um, yeah, we're going to use this equation. So let's see, the half-life is defined as the time it takes on average for half of a radioactive sample to decay. So once one half-life goes by, this is what we'll be dealing with. The number left will be half of the number I started with. And I want to solve for t when this is true. So all I'm going to do is plug that into my equation. So I'm going to replace n with half of my original starting number. And this, if I solve this for t now, that will be the half-life. That's the one specific time when I'm down to half of what I started with. All right, it's how long does it take for that to happen. So you just got to do some exponent math. Um, let's get rid of the n zeros on both sides. And... To solve for t, I'm going to have to do some natural logging. Um, I could natural log both sides right now, but then I got to deal with uh, log rules for dividing, and um, I don't feel like doing that. So I would say just simply uh, think of this as raising both sides to the negative one power. These are both kind of in the denominator, right? This really means this, uh, if I think about what a negative exponent means. So one over two equals one over this. 
well then this must be true right um and again you could do it with natural log of one minus natural log of two think about what the natural log of one means and make sure that makes sense you get there either way but now we're just going to go ahead and solve this for um t so now we natural log both sides divide by the decay constant and there we go Okay, so this is a formula for half-life depending on decay constant. This is not in your data booklet. So you're not given this. They, it's definitely the expectation that you will do this on the exams to just knowing the definition of half-life and being able to quickly do some exponent math. To be honest, you might use it enough that you might kind of more or less memorize this. And if you have any uh, fear, stress, or anxiety about doing this natural log math on the exams, you can always commit this to memory, but you will need to use this, um, that the half-life is equal to the natural log of two divided by the decay constant and make sure you're okay conceptually with the difference between the decay constant and half-life. There are different things, think of the units. Okay, so that's how we get the half-life if we know the decay constant and vice versa. So let's try one. Um, here's a classic example. They even love this on like the SAT. Uh, because this is a good one where you can do some radioactive decay or some exponential uh, d decay stuff. But uh, carbon dating, this is how carbon dating works. Um, there's a radioactive isotope of carbon that every living thing kind of creates. It's part of a natural biological process. Um, and so should you find some bones uh, from, from long ago, you can basically dig them up, cut them up, look at the, uh, the carbon inside and figure out how much carbon-14 there is compared to the uh, what it decays into. So, for example, let's say we find some old bones or something, and there's 22% of the radioactive nuclei, the carbon-14 that were originally present, we can tell have decayed. So how long has it been? Well, since we know the half-life of carbon-14, we can date this stuff very accurately um, and get a really good picture of how old it is. Okay, so you try this. Pause it. Make sure you can um, apply those ideas we just talked about. Try to use those equations and see how it goes. There's the answer you should get. Um, so try it out. Okay, how'd you do? Did you do this? Um, here's the trick, the main trick, and they love to do this. So you always got to think about what you're looking at. 22% have decayed. Well, the equations are all about what's left over. So... Um, just keep in mind that means there must be 78% left. All right. So uh, one way to think of it is like this then. The fraction of what you got to what you started with is 78%. Or if this makes any more sense to you, this is really what we're doing. The number you have is 78% of the number you started with. That's what this number tells me. You just have to think about that. Um, and then I can plug it into the equation. Um, no matter how you slice it, you're going to get something like this. The natural log of 0.78 equals negative decay constant times time. Now, I'm given the half-life. I need the decay constant. So here's where our handy formula that we just came up with is going to work, where it's going to come in. All right, so the natural log of 2 divided by the decay constant is the half-life. So cross-multiply the, uh, you know, this, this must be true too. Decay constant must be natural log of 2 divided by half-life. Um, you can keep whatever units they give you because... If I get my decay constant in per years, then I'll just be able to get an answer in years, which is convenient. So you don't have to change to seconds or anything like that. It would be um, a little too much to, to do that here, um, and it wouldn't help anything. So um, just kind of look at how this works out and make sure that makes sense to you. Um, this should not be a negative. Oopsies. So it's just the natural log of 2 over 5,700 is the decay constant. So the decay constant is yay much per year. So, you know, pretty low percentage per year that any one single one will decay, but there's so, 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 so many. Um, all right, now this should be a negative because of this guy. So the time left is negative natural log of 0.78 divided by the decay constant, which we just found, and you should get about this many years. I'm being bad with sig figs, but that's the idea. All right, um, so, you know, it's really just all about that decay constant stuff and thinking about number remaining always all right just a couple other things about um radioactivity so that's a pretty long half like 5700 years and there are other uh, elements isotopes radioisotopes that have super long half-lives here's the half-life of uranium 238 almost four and a half billion years so you would 
be smart to ask how the heck do we possibly know that number because um the often the way that you can measure the half-life of something is to watch it decay you can you know create um by bombarding say lead with alpha particles or something you can create the good old isotope of polonium we were playing with the other day in the sim um and you can watch it decay you can watch it exponentially decay you could graph you could get a, a sensor and graph the activity over time and you would get exponential decay curve and you could truly take something like logger pro or excel put a fit on it figure out the rate of decay um figure out the decay constant and figure out the half-life well if you tried to do this with uranium right you could spend your whole lifetime measuring uranium and the curve would look like this yeah there is no meaningful reduction in how active it is when we actually take these measurements you can't get you know it it takes way too long for us to see any kind of exponential decay happening in a reasonable interval of time so what we do is we use this handy equation because this equation really spells out how we can figure out half-life even if we don't actually wait for this thing to decay uh, over billions of years um because this is the relationship that like uh really calculus tells me is happening um so this is what I'm looking for, because if I know the decay constant like we just did, I can find the half-life. So really all I need to do is find the activity and find the number. Okay. Um, this is a whole like objective in the IB guide of um, something like explain how long half-lives are measured. So they like to ask you this, and there's a couple key things you always want to say. And again, really, you just think about this equation, and this will guide you. You got to just um, walk through each of these three parts. So uh, I guess first I'm doing N. We can think about how you would find N. And N would just come from mass. All you would do is you would mass your substance. You do have to make sure it's a pure substance. Um, so if you're doing uranium-238, you got to make sure your sample is all uranium-238s, um, which there's ways to do that. So you um, measure the mass of the uranium-238 that you have, and then you compare that, really divide out the molar mass of uranium-238 because you know how much one uranium-238 weighs or how much a mole of uranium-238 weighs. So you can figure out how many uranium-238s you got. You can figure out and the number just by knowing the mass and dividing. Um, next is A. We got to find the activity, and we find that with what's called a Geiger counter. So the activity you measure with a Geiger counter, um, you see it in all the movies, that's a clicky, clicky, clicky thing. Um, so that'll directly measure activity. Then you do just have to remember it's subtract away background because there's other radioactive stuff all around all the time. And so I wanna know just how much activity is coming from the uranium. Well, then I gotta subtract any background that I measure um, in the lab. And then I just divide, yeah? Because the decay constant is activity divided by N. So you just wanna show that you understand that this is the equation that you're you know, basing everything on. So you're gonna divide activity by N to get the decay constant. Um, and then from the decay constant, as we just saw, you can get the half-life. Yeah, so that there is pretty much the process for measuring long half-lives. That's how we know, even though we don't have to wait for something to decay. All right, and lastly, if you're curious what a Geiger counter is, um, here it is. All right, so here's like a little schematic of the Geiger counter of what's going on inside, how we can tell that there's a radioactive event. A radioactive event, remember, is um, really just like little charged particles or um, sometimes a gamma ray flying around. Um, so... It's ionizing radiation. So what will happen is if a radioactivity passes through, a, especially a low-pressure gas like they have in here, um, it will tend to ionize gas in the cube, um, pull some electrons away. And once that gas becomes ionized, it is electrically charged. And so we hook it up to a little supply, um, allow current to flow from the ionized gas. And every time the gas gets ionized, a little quick bump of current flows. And we measure that little tiny bump of current, and that's a count. Um, so that's all it really is. It's uh, here's here's the picture. You don't really need to know all the, all the details of this, but uh, it's there if you're interested. And that's what's going on. It's just a gas in a tube that's um, going to uh, detect basically every time the gas gets ionized. All right. So there you go. There is your um, intro to the ideas of HL nuclear physics equations, exponential decay. It's fun. So go try some practice and have fun.